perfect ways. All I'm in need of, his hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. I can't remember one single regret in serving God only and trusting His hand. I can't remember a trial or a pain. He did not recycle to bring All I'm in need of, His hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. This is my anthem, and this is my song. The theme of the stories I've heard for so long. God has been faithful, He will be again. His loving compassion, it knows no end. All I'm in need of, His hand will. He's always been faithful He's always been faithful He's always been faithful to me Great is thy faith O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever Good morning. Let's take our seats. We'll get started this morning. Try to move towards the center if you can, just to make every seat available. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 81.1. And the purpose of this, this call, this call to worship, is to prepare ourselves to worship God. So please hear the word of the Lord. Sing aloud to God, our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your strength. It is seen in creation itself. It is seen throughout the pages of redemptive history. We see it when you delivered your people out of Egypt and when you took back the land you promised to your people. We see your strength in the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. We see it as the Holy Spirit empowered the apostles to plant the first churches. Father, your people needed your strength then, and we need it now. Please keep drawing people to yourself. Please keep showing people their need for salvation. Holy Spirit, please activate your words and grant the gift of repentance and faith. Help people turn from trusting in themselves and start trusting in Christ. Help them stop trusting their own strength and abilities and start trusting in Christ's. Holy Spirit, continue to sanctify us. Continue to conform us to the image of Christ so we can praise and worship you rightly. 
Father, teach us to depend on you for strength and you alone. We ask these things for the praise of you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Yes, let's stand together and sing aloud about our trust in Jesus Christ and ask for the grace to trust him even more. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, and to know the same. To trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus Simply taking life and rest And joy and peace Come on. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. Trust him Behold. 
eternal, humble to the grave. Jesus, Savior, is and now to reign. Behold our God, seated on His throne. Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Guys, you will reign forever. We fill the earth. You will reign forever. We fill the earth. You will. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 7 for our scripture reading this morning. Remember that in John 7, Jesus has gone up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths and he has begun teaching. He has declared that he is from God, his teaching is from God, and he has condemned the Jews for their failure to carry out the law. And this morning we see the aftermath of that. We see Jesus to continue, continue to declare who he is, and uh, we see different responses to his claims. Follow along as I read verses 25 through 39. So some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they are, are seeking to kill? Look, he is speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? However, we know where this man is from, but whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, You both know me and know where I am from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, When the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Therefore Jesus said, For a little while longer I am with you, then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me, and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He's not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is this statement that he said, You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for Christ and, and how he proved beyond any doubt that he truly was and is your Son, and that he came to do your will and to speak your words. He lived a perfect, holy life. He performed 
unmistakable signs. He taught with divine power and authority. He died and rose from the grave. He ascended into heaven. He sent your spirit to sanctify and indwell your people. Lord, all of this changed the course of human history. These events are the focal point, the climax of history. Humanity had no hope and was doomed to suffer the wrath of God, but all of that changed with the coming of Christ. And so, Lord, we thank you that you offer us living water through him, even though we do not deserve it. We are born as depraved sinners in rebellion against you, but your grace is greater. And for this, we thank you and we humbly ask that you will help us to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And Father, we thank you again for the precious truth that we've heard from Romans 3 over the last few weeks. We ask that you would produce abundant fruit through the preaching of your word this morning. Give Paul wisdom and clarity, and, may we, and we pray that the saints would, uh, would be encouraged, that sinners would repent and turn to you in faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as Jared just prayed and as we've been learning, it is the love of Christ that changes everything. In him, we have the righteousness of God. So as we stand together, go ahead and stand and begin singing again. It is that love of Christ that unifies us. It is what is the core of who we are as a church. Here we go. It was love that brought you from above to walk upon the earth. Love that caused your weariness, your hunger and your thirst. It was love that caused you to be tied, tempted by the foe. And love that caught the nails and cross, and love that bought my soul. How wonderful your love, the mystery of mysteries, filling up my heart. Glorious and I know how wonderful your love There's nothing else so sweet to me I'll never be apart from the lover of my soul From the lover of my soul Your love is filled with holiness O oh Spirit, fan this flame your love will never cease or cool. Your love will never change. Oh, let me see your love for me around me everywhere. The shining sun, a gentle rain, remind me of your care. How wonderful your love. The mystery of mysteries filling up my heart. Glorious and I know how wonderful your love. There's nothing else so sweet to me. I'll never be apart from the lover of my soul. From the lover of my soul. How wonderful your love. The mystery of mysteries filling up my heart. Glorious and I know how wonderful your love. There's nothing else so sweet to me. I'll never be apart from the lover of my soul. From the lover of my soul. the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and breathes for me my name is graven on his hands my name is written on his heart I know Stands. No tongue can bid me then depart. 
No tongue can bid me thence depart. Yes, amen. Thankful for that this morning. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased with his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and God, with Christ my Savior and my God. One more. One with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased with his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Christ my Savior and my God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we are uh, so grateful that we can just gather this morning for worship as sinners that have been redeemed by your grace. And as we have just saying, we are, we are eternally grateful for our great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for us all. So we are profoundly grateful that, that Christ condescended to us in order to redeem us, that his wounds have paid our ransom. Therefore, we boast only in Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection. And so our hearts celebrate this morning that Christ is indeed risen that our hope rests on him, that through his death and resurrection we have been reconciled to you, God, that because of the Lord Jesus Christ we stand before you as sons and daughters, citizens of your kingdom, and enjoy fellowship with you now and for all eternity to come. And we thank you for all your blessings that you have given us, both spiritually and physically, that we have been given just because of your great love for us. We thank you that every good gift comes from you. And we give you all the praise and honor, knowing these great blessings that you have given us are ours, despite the fact that we are not worthy of them. We also thank you for the work that you are accomplishing on this earth, that you are building your church, building your kingdom. And we ask that you help us stay faithful to all that you have called us to do, recognizing that great honor that we have to participate in your gospel mission as we are witnesses to you calling sinners to yourself for the glory of your name. What a joy it is to be a partaker in your work here on earth. Father, your goodness, your kindness, it knows no bounds. And so our soul will sing praises to you. We will not be silent. O oh Lord, our God, we will give you thanks forever and ever. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we come this morning to the end of Romans 3. And... Um, what a great week this has been for our church. It's been a, a week of returns. Our students made it back in one piece from uh, youth camp. And just uh, the Lord greatly honored and blessed your prayers in that. We're just excited to see what the Lord is doing through our student ministry and just so encouraged by that. And then 
Also, on Monday evening, the Moorhead family returned from the Czech Republic. They're going to be here for a couple of months. You're going to get to see them, and, and uh, for some of you to get to know them. You, last time they were here, you were not even uh, part of Grace Church, and so it's been a while since they've been here. We're excited to have them back and just to minister to them and encourage them, their family, as they are getting some respite from the mission field. Just so thankful for the ministry that is carrying on there, and uh, just thankful for this family, how they are such an example to us, and we love them very much glad that they are here back with us and will be here for a couple of months. Well, as I said, we come this morning to the end of Romans 3. As a church, we're studying together the book of Romans every Sunday morning, and, and uh, we're, we're just going through it verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, and, and so on. And in this small section here, focusing on Romans 3, verses 27 through verse 31, this, this small section is a turning point in the book of Romans. Uh, Paul has been establishing the, the bedrock of his entire argument and his whole purpose in the first three chapters. Uh, it's really the, the, the larger introduction to the whole book. It, 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 Paul's saying everything he wants to say in those three chapters, and then he's going to show us the implications of that following. But here at the end of chapter 3, it's kind of a, a turning point. It's, it's, uh, it's picking up uh, from what we saw in the first three chapters, and it's establishing what we're going to now see starting in chapter 4. In fact, a lot of the key words that he uses here in these few verses are going to be key words that you'll find again in Romans, in Romans chapter 4. So you can see that there. But as we think about this passage, we think about uh, things that unite and divide us. Things like organized religion. I mentioned this last week as we began to look at this particular text. Uh, what is wrong with organized religion? And, and there's a lot of things that... We as a people, as a culture, get organized around, right? Um, we, we could talk about things like politics, but I don't want to talk about that. Uh, those are things that divide us, Republican versus Democrat, independent and libertarian, all those kind of things. We could talk about college sports. You are either of Alabama or Auburn, and there is no in-between here. Uh, you, you have to pick those kind of things. And probably more important than all of these is the division that exists between those who do not write in their books and those who write in their books when they're reading. And as we all know, it is the only right answer is to write in your books and to take notes and, and those kind of things. And, and the nerd that I am on those kind of things, I, I, I began to wonder, where did this mark that I use so often every day in my books as I righteously write in them, and they're mine, by the way, don't write in someone else's books, Ben Holland. Um, <laughs> It's true. Yeah, he knows it. Um, but I, I started to wonder, where does this mark that I use all the time, this asterisk, this little star, where did it come from? And believe it or not, there are these folks called paleographers. Uh, this is a profession that goes back and they, they study the, the evolution of language and letters and how did this letter become this letter and, and, and how did it morph and change into all of these other things. They are paleographers or those who study the development of language and they only eat meat. Um, that's a paleo... No. <laughs> paleographers, they, they have done the work for us. They have traced the history of these things. And, and I looked at, and found actually there's an article on this where a paleographer has traced the the, the modern usage of the, uh, of the asterisk, the, the little star that we might use to highlight something in a text. And the modern usage goes back to Aristarchus of Samothrace, and, and this is about 200 years before Christ. And he was an editor of Homer's writings, the, the Greek poet, not the other one. Um, he used an asterisk symbol to edit his work. And so he would use uh, the, the little asterisk mark to, uh, to note key text or passages as he's editing that, and some that he thought were not original to Homer as he was editing those, those manuscripts. Even the word asterisk itself, it's, it has something in common with our word asteroid. It comes from the same, derives from the same Greek word meaning little star, which is uh, why it looks the way it does. Actually, it became named that way long after it was used that way. Because the symbol even goes back much further. It's been found on cuneiform tablets from the ancient Sumerians as far back as 2000 BC. That's the time of Abraham and so on. Well, one paleographer who studies these things has concluded that all the various usage of the asterisk was an editing tool, quote, to notify the reader that the passage they are reading should be read with caution. I read this long essay on the asterisk and its history just to 
be told what I already knew, uh, that this is important. When you find an asterisk in a text, it, it's saying, note this well. We even have other ways of referring to that. Nota bene, sometimes abbreviated NB. Note well, pay special attention. It calls attention to something important. To notify the reader that the passage they are reading should be read with caution. Well, this text in front of us is like a, it's like kind of two different things. It's like a footnote to everything that's come before it, but it's also like a, a giant asterisk for what you are about to read starting in chapter 4. Reader, note well, dear reader, the passage we are about to read should be read with caution. If we do not understand what Paul is saying here, things will go off the rails pretty quickly. We will misunderstand very fundamental concepts like, who is God and what is the gospel and what difference does it make in the life of the church and the people that he's forming? So there's an asterisk here for us. It's not one that's been put by us, but it's one that's been put by the Holy Spirit at this, this transitional place in Romans. And we need to note this well. There needs to be some caution. We need to spend some time here looking at this and understanding it carefully. Well, I want to read our text this morning. We are Romans 3. I'll read verses 27 through verse 31. We began to look at it last week. We'll continue on today. Beginning in verse 27, Paul says, when, uh, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Something you will hear from time to time, and maybe you've even thought this or said this, certainly you've heard this, I don't believe in organized religion. Well, there's any number of reasons that are brought out for this. Uh, the, the church, and usually it's that, that kind of statement is, is zeroed in on the church, the body of Christ. Uh, I don't like it because there's hypocrites there. They're, they're cold-hearted. They don't understand. Maybe they have unloving leaders. They have an ingrown fellowship. They become stagnant in their love for people. To which we say all of those things and much more are possibilities for any church. Many view the church from the pew, when what they really need is the perspective of the cross. It's all about perspective, isn't it? That if we put our focus entirely on man and what man has done to me and how man has disappointed me and how a local church or any church or the church at large or whatever we want to conceive of, as it's disappointed me, I will choose to be disappointed in it and I will throw off all of it. And so one becomes jaded. And I would argue that one will become jaded with Christians in the church if you come to it expecting glorified heaven on earth rather than sanctified sinners who are ongoingly being sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you come in the doors of any church and get involved in the fellowship of any body of Christ expecting it to be glorified heaven on earth, then you will be disappointed. Because that has not come just yet. Uh, what we have instead is a, a body of ragtag, barely held together sinners who are being sanctified away and apart from their sin to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you have in the church. Anything else certainly will become jaded. If we look close enough, it's inevitable that we'll find something wrong with what we might call organized religion. Uh, not too long ago, I had to have a, a building inspector come to my house to do exactly what his title says, to inspect the building, to uh, see if, uh, if our work would hold up, if it would pass inspection. His entire job is to do one thing. It is to find something wrong. That's his job. In the same way, a lot of people are church inspectors. 
They have not come to join. They have not come to be a part of what God is forming in Jesus Christ, but they have come to find something wrong. And by the way, you, you will. Like I said, you will find hypocrisy. You will find people who are cold and stagnant in their love. You will find, at times, fellowship and, and little groups and subgroups that become ingrown and, and fail to reach out to others the way we should, and we know we have, have been reached out by, uh, to ourselves. You'll find all those things. For all of our disorganization, all of our sinful imperfections, all of our hypocrisy, all of our weaknesses in fellowship and love, nevertheless, we are still organized under the head of the church, Jesus Christ. We believe in that part of the organized part. Jesus is calling out. That's what the word church means, ecclesia. It's a, it's a body of regenerated, called out ones. We are being called out of the world, not to go live outside of the world, but to continue to live in the world, not be of the world. But we are called out of this world, and he is forming, he is organizing, if you will, a body that belongs to him that has been purchased with his blood. That's the organizing principle. The Apostle Paul has been teaching us that the organizing principle, bringing us together as a church, is not all this other stuff. It's not Auburn, Alabama. It's not politics. It's not even whether you choose to write in your books or not, or even other little nuances and particular views and viewpoints that we all have as Christians and individuals. The organizing principle bringing us together as a church is the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ that saves us from our sins, reconciles us to our Father, grants us His Spirit to live as a new creation with new life in Him. That's the organizing principle of the church. You can also work out from that that if anything else becomes the organizing principle of the church, even good things, Style of music. How big are we? How little? How many elders? And what, how we, all these other things and the politics and all that other kind of stuff. If anything else replaces that central organizing principle, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans, then that church is no longer walking in faithfulness. It's happening all the time. Anything else will not hold a church together. No other affinity will do. Here at the end of Romans 3, Paul helps us identify a few areas and ways of thinking that are out of step with the gospel. These are things that are out of character. This, this can happen in the church. It can happen in the individual's life. But these are all things that are out of step, out of character with the realities that Paul has been unpacking for the last three chapters. He has belabored the point of the gospel, the centrality of Christ and the gospel, and all of these things. And, and now he begins to hint at some things that can distract us, that can destroy the church, that can cause us to walk away from the truth. In these last five verses here, the Apostle Paul shows us what is truly wrong with organized religion. His perspective is refreshing, and he's not jaded. It's, it's not from someone who is trying to deconstruct everything. He's not someone who's trying to tear down the church. He's, Paul is writing as a member of the church, as someone who is wanting to help and encourage and exhort the people of God. And his outlook is not from the disorganization in the pew, but from the divine order of the cross and the gospel. So we've been asking the question, what might be wrong with our organization as a local body. What, what might be wrong? We need to look at that. And we started to do this last week. Number one, just quick review here. It's pride. Because boasting, all boasting is excluded by the gospel unless it is boasting in the God of the gospel. We saw this in verse 27. Paul says, where then is boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. Verse 27 begins a new section that focuses on the vital theme of faith. It's the initial statement, and chapter 4 is a more detailed elaboration. It's, it's an, introductory, an introduction, it's a summary of what we're going to see in chapter 4. Everything that Paul says now comes out of all that he has said about our justification in Christ. And his logic might go something like this. 
If we reverse this a little bit, it might be something like this. Paul could reason this way. If the organizing principle of our life, of your life, is your works, then by all means, boast away. And in fact, Jesus would say on another occasion that if, if that's what you live for, then you're going to receive your reward in full in this life. If that's what you live for, for someone and for yourself to boast in what you've done, then that's all the reward you're going to receive. If the organizing principle of our life is our works, then boast away. But Paul is saying in verse 27, it's not. You belong to Jesus. That's what he's been saying. Paul's answer to all of this at the end of verse 27 is that our life belongs to Jesus, not by our works, but solely by faith. S. Lewis Johnson said that boasting is self-announcing while faith is self-renouncing. What does faith do? Well, faith technically achieves nothing. It's an empty hand that receives and trusts in what God gives. When it comes to faith, this is what Paul is saying here, there's no credit to be claimed, there's no accomplishment to admire other than what God has done for us. And Paul grounds his assertion, he explains further in verse 28. Look at verse 28. For we maintain, we hold, we reason that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Verse 28 has a gigantic asterisk out beside it. It is really central to all that Paul has said before this and all that Paul is going to say. If you want to really get down to the true transitional statement, it is verse 28. No one can come to Christ through their own works, through their own obedience, through their own goodness. Any organized religion apart from Jesus and what he is organizing, listen friends, it is a false religion of works. Every single one. If we think about it this way, as we'll see later on in Romans, that the wages of sin is death. That's, that's what we contribute. Uh, the wages that we have earned, all of our works, what have they earned for us? They have not earned heaven. They have not earned a better seat with the big man upstairs. They have not earned us a better hearing, a more favorable position. All of our works, when accumulated, when seen from the perspective, not of the pew, but of the cross, it earns us death. That's what we've earned, all of us. And so if you think about that, if my own human efforts are central to my problem, then why would I think that adding more will help? Have you thought about that? E even the lost atheists will say things like, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah I, I lie, I haven't done this or that, I've, I've failed my family, I haven't been honest in certain things, whatever, but I'm a good person. There's some who go by the name of Christian, and it's Christian in name only, who would make the same argument. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as good as everybody thinks I am, but, uh, you know, and I, I've lied, and I've, I have, wasn't always honest with my parents, and I, maybe I wasn't faithful in this area or that, but you know what? Deep down, I'm a good person. That is a false religion of works, and it will not save, it will only condemn. If we're not of one mind as a church on this gospel, then it's only a matter of time before something else will grab our attention. That's true both corporately, that's also true personally. What do I mean by that? As a church, if we as a collective corporate body of Christ, as the membership of this church, if we get sidetracked away from this, then, then we are off in left field. And now we're in some of the territory of the churches of, of Revelation in the first few chapters there. We're losing sight of the most central aspects of our church and what we are and who we are in Christ. But that can also happen at an individual level. Do you understand that? You can be a part of a church that's faithful and you can be a part of a church that is not losing sight of the gospel, but you personally can get sidetracked by your own sin. You can start to believe lies. You can start to drift into lanes that the Lord has not opened up to you.
Our boast is to be located where then? Our boast is in the Lord, who he is and what he's done. Well, there's another problem which can corrupt a local church that loses sight of the gospel. And this is what we want to look at this morning. Number two, it's division. It's division. Um, Why? Because positively speaking, God is exalted by a unified church. Now, when we talk about division and unity, we're not talking about worldly examples of that. We're not talking about superficial attempts at unity and by holding hands and singing kumbaya and all those kinds. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a deep, gospel-saturated unity that is rooted in the name and the purpose and the will of Christ in which a people who otherwise would never get together are then brought together in Jesus Christ. And they are made one as a body of Christ. And that temporary local expression called the church will one day be joined with all the other local expressions. And we will all be together. And not just singing in our local expressions, but singing and rejoicing and working and loving the kingdom of our Lord gathered around His, theme, uh, his throne. That is the key theme of the entire Bible. It's all moving in that direction. Paul's main point, as we look at this morning in verses 29 and 30, is justification by faith applies to all believers so that no true division exists or is to exist among the saved and the converted. Because justification by faith applies to all believers, there's to be no division. There's to be no disunity. And, and where that shows its face and its, and its ugly heart, it is to be recognized as something that is out of step with the truth of God and the gospel. If the gospel is fundamentally about salvation, then the implications of that have a direct bearing on the body of Christ, the church. Who gets in? Who gets into the church? Who is it that makes up the people of God. Well, we saw the, the first part of the answer back in verse 28. It's who gets in. It's those who are justified through Christ alone. That's the only way in. It's not by our works. It's not by anything else. And now we see in, also in verse 29, those who are justified in Christ and unified by the one true God. That's the other side of the answer. So it's those who are justified and they are brought together and justified in the name of the one true God. Paul expounds on what he means by that. Look at verse 29 again. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, Paul answers his own question, of Gentiles also. What is Paul driving at here? Here's his point. The God of the Jews is the same God that saves Gentiles. Now, that's not a universalist argument. That's not what he's arguing for. He's not saying, yep, uh, we just all serve the same God, different names, different shades, different uh, regions of of the globe and all those kind of things. That's not what Paul is saying here. Actually, what he's saying here has a long, very deep biblical history that goes back to the beginnings of of God's promise to save a people for himself, primarily through Abraham. A man who was, before he was Abraham, was Abram. He was a, a pagan worshiper. He goes back to Genesis 12. And again, Paul is intimating, he's highlighting here what he's going to expound in full in chapter 4. We'll see a lot about Abraham there. But the background to what Paul says here about God being not only the God of the Jews, but also the Gentiles, that's not a New Covenant, New Testament truth. That is, has always been the truth since God revealed the good news that was to come to his people. You can look at passages later on, like Genesis 12 and Genesis 17, where the Lord, when he first brings Abraham out and he says to you, he says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make a nation from you. And he's talking about Israel at that point. Israel will come out of Abraham and his descendants. But he says something else in Genesis 12, verse 3 and following. He says, in you and through all that I'm going to do, these promises of salvation and blessing, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth. Isn't that amazing? 
It's not just for you individually. It's not just for even just the singular nation that will come from you. But I'm going to bless all the nations. This is why you can call Abraham in Genesis 17 the, the father of a multitude of nations. What Paul says in verse 29, if you can read it this way, it is the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham. And we're going to see that again in chapter 4. That what God said he would do, guess what? God did. Uh, God's like that, by the way. When God promises to do something, he actually does it. It's not always on our timetable, by the way, but he always does it. Paul's logic in verse 29 goes something like this. If salvation comes through doing the works of the law, then how would this be good news for Gentiles? Because Paul's already shown us that's not even good news for Jews. Because they had the law and couldn't be saved by the law. It it only just exposed their sin more. It only exposed their hard hearts even more. How in the world would that be good news for Gentiles? If those who were the first to receive the law from God Rejected it. The church is to be a united witness to the grace of God. This is what he's saying here. The church is the chief place. It is the location where unity in Christ is displayed. I I don't have to tell you, we live in a secular age where hostility to the gospel is growing by the minute. And you could do one of two things, and I think Christians are making a a large, grand mistake on one of these fronts. One of the mistakes is that you can war against a culture that is throwing some heat on the church. Or you can choose to be salt and light, and you can exalt Christ in the face of all of those kind of things. The church that gets that right, I think, will be blessed in the Lord. It doesn't mean that the heat will go away. It doesn't mean that the problems will go away. It doesn't mean that persecutions will dry up. But the church is to be a united witness to the grace of God. And the church must be a church with one voice on this key central issue. We are ambassadors for Christ. The church is an an outpost. It's an embassy of the king who is coming. There is one God, Paul says here, and salvation is found only in his son, Jesus Christ. It's not getting people to come over to your side on any number of pet issues. What difference does it make? Well, the Bible says that that truth is to be a comfort to you. Here's what the Lord said to Isaiah, Isaiah 45, verse 5. I am Yahweh, and there is no other God. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me. The God of the Jews, the God of the Gentiles. This is to be a comfort to you. This also helps us as a church recover and restore our purpose in the Lord. Uh, This was a significant issue for the church at Corinth, and Paul addresses that. There's a myriad of issues going on in that church. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, For there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things exist, and we exist through Him. This is our purpose. This restores that. He says in verse 30, Since, that is, or if indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. What in the world is he talking about here? Well, the cultural context of verse 30, it it sounds foreign to us in some ways, but what is inferred here is that there was a deep religious and cultural division between Jews and Gentiles. Now, we first encountered this this issue of circumcision back in Romans chapter 2, verse 25. And there, Paul was answering an implied objection that says circumcision will function as a protection against God's wrath. Isn't that crazy? Paul said, yes. The answer to that is yes. It is crazy. You think that a temporary carving in the flesh will protect you from the wrath of God. Well, yes, I believe that because it says we are God's chosen people. And Paul counters with that. That's not how you know that you're God's chosen people. Jews might say, we are the true people of God. We are the circumcised. 
How do we know that? Because they said, we are God's people. We are the circumcised. And so it becomes a misplaced spiritual pride that is so blind that they believe that it would protect them from God's judgment. Circumcision was also an intimate reminder to Abraham and his people where God's promises were literally seen in the flesh. It wasn't to cause them to trust in something that man's hands had done to them, but it was a reminder of God's eternal promises to their fathers and to them. This would be a symbol in Israel of their separation. You, you think of when David and Goliath are, are going to, uh, to that lopsided battle. And they are the uncircumcised Philistines. That, that was a distinction between Israel and all the nations around them. It, it highlighted their separation. It also highlighted their purity to, and their call to observe the word of God at the most intimate places of the human body. There is a constant reminder. We belong to the Lord by his grace and we are to know his word. And it also showed their loyalty to the covenant that God had made with Abraham and all of Israel. We'll see, we'll come back to some of those things in chapter 4. But here's what was often missed. It was an outward, temporary sign. Israel and all people would need more than this. Moses said something very important to all of this. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, he said, A day will come when Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Why? So that you may live. It goes something like this. An outward symbol cannot change the heart to love God. How does that apply to us? A ritual, a liturgy, a tradition cannot change the heart or grant new life, ever. How do we know this? Well, just ask people why they think they will be with God when they die. What do they point to? Do they point to the finished work of Christ or do they point to something else? You know what that something else is? It, it is just a modern form of circumcision. It's just a, a modern form of trusting in an outward symbol, an outward sign, some work. Most don't plead the finished work of Christ. They plead the crumbling works of their own hands. Another thing that was happening was that, get this, some of the Jews who converted to Christ likely thought that Gentiles could not be saved unless they were circumcised. That's a background issue in the entire book of Galatians and Acts 15 with the Jerusalem Council. Now, can you imagine for a moment saying something like this? There's no way he's saved because they don't follow, his family doesn't follow the same customs or practices as our family on matters of liberty. Can you even imagine someone saying that today? Can you imagine thinking that a fellow brother or sister in Christ is less than because they look different, they speak differently, they travel in different circles? The division in our context may not be Jew and Gentile, but the divisions of the heart still remain, do they not? Here's key in verse 30. Here's what this is about. Paul is emphasizing that faith is the only decisive possession of the one who enters the kingdom of God. It's not anything else. Again, this is just a brief preview of what Paul will say in chapter 4. How do we know that God is the God of both Jew and Gentile alike? Because he says here, God will justify both. Notice he uses a future tense here, will justify both. But, but that doesn't mean that justification is something that is going to happen in the future, as if we don't know whether we're truly justified in Christ now, and it's only to, to wait until later, or at the end of all things. But what he's doing here is that he's saying this is so certain that what he has presented here is a timeless truth, and they would do that, often capture that, with a future tense in this case. Notice in verse 30, the God who justifies is one. He is one. What does this mean? Because there's only one God, there's only one way to be right with God. 
God is not bifurcated. God is not divided in his heart. There, he doesn't have multiple ways of, of coming to him and being reconciled with him. He, even over the span of, of time, space, and history, all throughout uh, redemptive history and revelation from Genesis to Revelation, there's still only one way to be reconciled with God. Even before the cross, those before the cross were anticipating and hoping and trusting in the promises of God by faith of what God said he would do and he did on the cross. We on this side of the cross are like them, but instead of looking forward, we are looking back. But it's all rooted together, isn't it? The God who justifies is one. Now, that is also another Jewish call out here, if you will, uh, back to the Shema. Now, the Shema was the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, right? That's Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. He is the one God. That central John 3.16 type Old Testament truth is something that is brought up again and again in the New Testament in Jewish context. Even James, the half-brother of our Lord, when he's writing the epistle of James and, and he's addressing Jews, Christian Jews who are dispersed, he says it's, it's actually not enough just to believe in that, but you must follow the implications of that. Why? Because he says even the demons believe that. You believe God's one? You're, you're monotheistic? Great. The demons believe that too. What difference does it make? How has that shown fruit in your life? What is the, the evidence of pure and undefiled religion in your life? James asks the question. The oneness of God demands everyone is justified the same way. Otherwise, Israel might have a false confidence. Or they might think that God is not concerned with every race and nation. It would be very easy for them to think that. That's a constant issue all throughout Scripture. If you want to see a, an example of that, just look at the story of the life of Jonah. Uh, Jonah was a missionary to Gentiles, and he hated it every step of the way. Why? Because God might be merciful to them. God might show care and love and be compassionate toward them. People are still the same way. The one God is not an addendum to a person's life, but He is our life. Without Him, we do not exist. Nothing holds together. Forgiveness is nothing more than a foreign metaphysical concept. David Pallison, who's now with the Lord, he said, the way to recognize this about one's life is to reflect on whether we believe in the one God and all of its implications is to reflect on whether God has any objective significance or necessary relevance to your life. He says this is why our age is not a Christian one, but a therapeutic one. All our problems are explained as dysfunctional emotions, erratic behaviors, or unstable thoughts rather than a rupture in a relationship with the one true God. If you, begin with, if you begin with our problems, you will only end with more. If you begin and end with God, you will be blessed. Here in verses 29 and 30, Paul is not describing a cheap, shallow, facile unity, but for Jews and Gentiles to come together in one body means that hearts had to be changed by God. Radical spiritual amputation needed to take place. Ethnic hatreds needed repentance. Arrogant and sinful partiality had to be mortified and put away forever. For just a moment, I, I want us to consider what this looks like biblically. What does this look like for our church? Let's turn this into a question. How can we then exalt God as a unified church? Well, we realize that sinful division in all of its forms is a result of the fall. It's a result of, of sin. It all goes back to Genesis. Genesis 3 and the judgment of all nations in Genesis 10. Uh, you have it all there. Enmity at the most basic relationships. Husbands and wives, parents and children and, and all of those things. It's all right there. 
e- even in work and cultivated stewardship, turns into something of great difficulty. You have in Genesis 4, violence between human beings, brother against brother, right there. At the end of Genesis 3, because of man's sin, God sends them out from the garden. In Genesis 3, verse 23, the text says, He, that is God, drove the man away from his presence. So the cause of disunity is man in his sin, and God's judgment now rests upon that unless they are reconciled back to God in his presence and what he has provided. What this means is that disunity is not a result of a dysfunctional family. We all belong to one. It's not a result of a corrupt culture. We're all in it. It's not because of ethnic divisions, real or imagined. Fundamentally, true division is a God problem because of man's sin. But the church is to be the place where true unity can actually be found on the Lord's terms. Let me me note a few of these. So we are striving toward unity in Christ so that we are exalting the one God in Christ as a unified church. What does this look like? Number one, it is a focus on people. It is a focus on people. As we focus on people, various divisions and barriers begin to recede. The church is a a gathering of the redeemed where what may have divided us before is now checked at the door of our hearts and the actual door of the church. It It is guarded in that way. Here's what the Lord has done, Ephesians 2 verse 15. By abolishing in His flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two, Jew and Gentile, into one new man, thus establishing peace. Think about how Jesus' own disciples reflected this wonderful truth. You think of Matthew, Levi, the tax collector. He would be seen as a turncoat against his own Jewish people because he was in cahoots with the Roman government to collect taxes. They hated guys like that. And then in the same body of disciples, you also had Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot, who would have been a a mercenary, who would have been uh, someone who was uh, a, a Jewish nationalist. Some would even say they were Jewish terrorists who would murder those who were against Israel. And Jesus, in his wisdom, brought those kind of men together as his disciples. And guess what? He's brought those kind of people together as his church as well. You begin to see people as new creations and not problems. Paul says something similar to what we find here in Galatians 6, 14. May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. God is exalted when our relationships with people are firmly planted in the life-transforming work of the gospel. Secondly, and this, these go together, focus on love. Love is not just misaimed. Love is not just some metaphysical concept floating out there in the ether. Love is focused on people. Christ-like love does not come naturally to anyone. It's a supernatural thing. That our, it doesn't come naturally to anyone any more than our salvation came naturally to us, if you think about it. All Christians are growing in this kind of love. What is it? It's sacrificial, initiative-taking love, which is not just un, an unattainable dream, but it is the very thing that marks out the people of God as His unique people, as different In fact, it is the distinguishing mark of a Christian disciple. uh, Jesus said in John 13, verse 35, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. He says in Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. It's important to realize that you do not have to wait for the right circumstances to appear for you to exercise love towards someone else. Christian, biblical, Christ-like love is this. It is nothing less than your Redeemer's skillful and compassionate love expressed in and through you as a Christian. Love is a commitment to bring back those who wander away. 
Love is devoted to both give and receive encouragement every day. You're giving it, you're receiving it. You're, you're, you're uh, bolstering it, you're receiving it. You put yourself in a position to both give and to receive both. Hebrews 3 verse 13 says, Encourage one another day after day as long as it's called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Love will listen to people wiser than us. Those whose hearts are deeply formed and shaped by truth will listen to them. We'll hear what they have to say. When there's a genuine crisis in your life, the last thing you truly need is for someone to tell you what you want to hear. You need someone who will love you with the love of Christ. This happens as we are clear and compassionate with the gospel. And then finally, focus on communication. Focus on communication. We focus on people. We, we focus on the object of that, and that is the love of Christ being expressed through instruments in His hands. But then we do that not just by, well, I was just there, but we do that through kind, caring, compassionate, gospel-saturated words. That's what God has given us. Christ is exalted as we are lovingly honest, biblically nourishing, winsomely constructive, timely in our counsel, full of grace and light from the Word of God with our words. Just listen, if you will, to what Paul says about this in Ephesians 4, to the church. Grace Community Church, lay aside falsehood. Speak the truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. Why? We are members of one another. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the very need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who are hearing you. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So Grace Community Church, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put far away from you, along with all malice. Grace Church, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Do you see it? Do you hear it? This is how the gospel changes. This is how the gospel of Jesus Christ affects us at the very root of who we are and as a church. Let's commit our ways to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that the cross was not only a death sentence, but it was a joy for Christ that was set before him and he pursued our reconciliation by going to the cross, dying for us, being raised for us, and now granting us in our salvation new life so that we are no longer the same people we were when we walked in. But Lord, you are changing us. And our church is not what it should be and what it will become. But Lord, you are working in your people and you have promised to do that. We thank you for that. We thank you that we have the hope of the gospel and we can see in so many ways, a myriad of ways in our own fellowship and in many other churches who love your gospel, we can see the evidence of the gospel and the truth and the change that you are bringing about. Lord, we thank you for all of this. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, yes, we are unified in our worship of Jesus Christ now and we will be one day forevermore. That is a, a great motivation to think about the promises of God for us that have still yet to happen. You know, most of God's promises are in the future. Let's stand together and sing about how we will continue uh, to worship the Lord together.
the sing. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together. We will feast and we know more. In the dark of night, before the dawn, my soul be not afraid for the promised morning. Oh, how long, O oh, God of Jacob, be my strength. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored he has done great things we will say together we will feast and we know more every vow we've broken and betrayed you are the faithful one and from the garden to the grave bind us together bring shalom we will feast in the house of Zion we will sing with our hearts couple announcements before we close with the benediction. Both of them are opportunities to pray too, which I'm thankful for. The first one is yesterday we had a reception for our high school graduates and we have some flyers in the foyer there so you can pick one of those up and you can continue to pray for those graduates as they transition to this next chapter of their lives. The other is in regards to missions in May. We raised the most money we've ever raised in May for Missions in May, which was $54,000 and two, $54,283. We're extremely thankful for your generosity. And please, please pray as we pray for wisdom as we allocate those funds. All right, now we'll stand for our benediction. We'll say it together. It comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Let's do it. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.